Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Uh, a little squeeze here, starting uh, a little late because uh, someone was late. Someone was a little late. Do you have any defense for your tardiness? The traffic was heavy. The I traffic. tried to be on time. The traffic. It's always something. The traffic. Well, you said you were going to record at three, and then it, the you moved traffic. it around. I was doing a thing with my wife. I was at a thing. You know, I mean. I had to run from it. and then You had to run from the thing you were doing. Yeah, we. There, to your job. There was a friend in Austin who was in town. and we You were, had to run from the friend to your job. Well, you said we were going to record at four, then you moved it to three, so... So I moved it. Your job was moved. And you had to leave. Why don't you go back to the friend? I think you should go back to your friend. Go back, call your friend and say, go back to your friend. Let's just do the show. Let's, you go back to your friend. I think it's better for you to go back to your friend. Seriously? So, I'm dead serious. Please go back to your friend. I, Who's going to produce the show? I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. It's insane. Ahem. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. A uh, beautiful day in Austin, Texas. A uh, mass shooting downtown. Uh, and in true Austin fashion, no one was killed. 13 people injured. No one was killed. This city cannot even do that right. Amazing. Have you learned your lesson? Okay. Moving on. Big announcement to be made on the show. And I don't usually say that because we don't usually have big announcements. We have them rarely. Um. And this announcement, I believe, will be shocking. It will be stunning. And I'm not a shock value comedian. That's not what we do. Um, but this will be genuinely uh, paradigm shifting. It will, it will move people genuinely, I believe. And uh, because it is so unexpected, there's no, there's, there was never a hint you, you know, a lot of the things that happen here, there's some foreshadowing elements, but not this. This is uh, out of the blue, as they say. It's coming out of the blue. Mm -hmm. It is completely, uh, utterly, uh, without um, any preconceived... This, this is just happening organically. It, it, it just... It, it's really... It's shaken uh, me to my core, the announcement I'm about to make, because I'm, I, I understand how big of a deal it's going to be to people and how much it's going to throw them, throw them off. And I, and I want to do it with care and I want to prepare them uh, and I want to take the utmost care and caution with an announcement of this gravity, because this is, this is, there's gravity here. This is real. It's hard to even say. It's hard to vocalize. It's hard to get out of my mouth. It's hard to... Ben... Why are you <laughs> laughing? I don't know. Why are you laughing? What's funny about this? I don't know. I don't know. Five months ago, Ben's wife told us she was having an affair with Joe Rogan. <laughs> it was uncomfortable. <laughs> we respect and love Joe. He's incredibly generous. Nobody has done more for comics than Joe. No one. But even, even that being the case, it was still tough to hear that Ben's fiance his wife was having sex with Joe, who had been so good to both of us. It put us in a very difficult position. His wife then informed us that she was going to keep the affair going. <laughs> and in order 
to do that, we needed to move to Austin, Texas, so she could continue to have sex with Joe. Ben, being a good husband, <laughs> dutifully agreed, and he came to me, and he said, Katie wants to keep having sex with Joe Rogan. Do you think we should move to Austin to make it easier for her so that she doesn't have to keep flying. And I agreed. I said, yes. So Ben's wife has been carrying on an affair with Joe. Even the morning <laughs> of their nuptials, <laughs> they got married. But in, in the morning of that day, <clears throat> she was having sexual congress with Joe Rogan. And and she told Ben that at the wedding in front of a few of us. She had had a few drinks. And she said, I just want you to know I fucked Joe this morning. <laughs> now, something happened. There was a disagreement. I don't know what happened. We're not privy to that information. And I don't want to speculate. But Ben's wife has ceased her affair with Joe. She has stopped. She is no longer having an affair with Joe. Yes. She's back to sleeping with Ben. Mm. Now, it is awkward <laughs> living in Austin, Texas. So, the announcement is as follows. Because of Ben's wife and only Ben's wife, mm -hmm. It is time to leave Austin, Texas. The Tim Dillon Show will be leaving Austin, Texas. Um, in all seriousness, because what I was just saying was a joke, I hope, for your sake. It is a joke, right? I think so, yeah. In all seriousness, we came down here because the quarantine had warped everybody's minds. Mm -hmm. I had moved from L.A. to Palm Springs. I spent a lot of time in the desert alone in 120-degree weather. Um, and, and then I went on the road a lot, too, and I did a lot of stand-up, did comedy during the craziest uh, period in the history of this country, maybe, to do comedy, D during a pandemic with the most contentious presidential election. I did comedy the night Donald Trump was put into the hospital with covid I mean, this was fucking wild. Those shows were wild doing them. And we did them. We did them to go out and to make money, to see fans, to, to do it as carefully as we could to keep ourselves mentally healthy and keep people mentally healthy and keep people working that worked at comedy clubs. And we did them distance and we did them outdoors and we did them. And, and then Joe, who we love and respect said, I'm moving to Texas. And it, 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 it came at a time when L.A. was particularly bleak and nothing was open. And I had never loved Austin. I, I had gone here and I've done South by Southwest. I've done the Moon Tower Comedy Festival. But Austin to me always felt like Brooklyn. It was fun, but it was, yeah, a lot of hipsters and the food was good. A little one note. It's barbecue. We get it. Great Mexican food as well. Um, but it was a college town. It was a small City. This was not a uh, world class city. It just was not, and I hadn't been here for a while, and I, I I didn't know, and and I moved here because I felt like I needed something new, and that something new would be good. And yes, the taxes are better, and yes, there are uh, benefits to not being in L.A. And yes, L.A. has a host of problems. But I moved here because, first and foremost, I said, something new will be good. Um, I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, the city of Austin, Texas, is a city in the realm of the, of the artistic or whatever for people who have left New York or L.A. or never had the guts to go to New York or LA. It's for people who's, they've never figured out a way to make their art or whatever commercially viable. And they should have a city. 
Those people should have a place to get drunk at 2 a.m., to get high, to eat brisket. They should have it. It's their culture. Do not force them to be productive members of society. Uh, it shouldn't happen. That's the culture of Austin, of the slacker, the near-do-well, always has been, always will be. A few uh, exceptions, Mike Judge, Richard Linkletter, but the vast majority of Austin, quite proudly, is uh, a culture of not making it, not doing it, for whatever reason. Um, so when Joe wants to create a comedy hub here, God bless him, but he's fighting against a current, and cultures matter, and this culture has been around for a very long time. And I have no interest in colonizing a city and making people, uh, I I making it into a great comedy city. I don't care. Um, the tech people are moving here. They'll have 3D printed brisket. Uh, they'll they'll have, uh, you know, the, the house values will go up. I bought a home here. I'll rent it or I'll keep it. And I, I'm not worried about that. I think it's a great real estate move. I'm speaking solely about comedy and me and this show. It is not the move. Um, Austin has many of the problems of Los Angeles. Mm. A lot of the homeless people. There was a mass shooting last night. Mm. 13 people got injured. Not shot, not killed. Of course not. Even the mass shooters in Austin can't get it done. And the cops didn't even find the guy. Mm. He's running around here. On the loose, yeah. He's on the loose, we got a mass shooter on the loose. It could be any one of our friends. We should call the tip line and just read off my Instagram, the people I'm following. But we love Joe. We respect him. When Joe has a club, I'll come back here and work at that club and be excited to do so. But I, I, I just could not get in a groove with this city. I tried. Not really. Um, but I, I gave it some effort. I gave it, a, uh, you know. I've been I've been downtown four or five times. That's enough. That's enough. The first time I went down there, homeless people were throwing bottles at us as we walked out of the creek in the cave. People are being killed at night. The homeless are just going up and murdering comedians. And I don't even know, am I against that? <laughs> I I I I I'm put in this weird position of 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 having to care about a city that I've never cared about. And I, I can, in good conscience, do that. I only want to be funny. I only want to really affect people with what we do. I don't give a fuck about Austin. I love Texas. I love the areas around Austin are beautiful. I like Dallas and Houston and Fort Worth, and the audiences are great. But I don't care what happens to the comedy community of Austin, Texas. I don't care. It has been forever... Uh, a community of sloth-like people. Truly, slugs. Slugs. And they should have it. It should be for them. Joe Rogan could walk around here and ask people, be like, hey, why don't you write more? Shouldn't you work out? It's not going to work because they're losers to the bone. These people are losers to the fucking bone. The stench of human failure in this city is so that you cannot breathe. You cannot inhale oxygen because the stench of human failure infects all of the air. It is a grotesquerie here. They do not know how to run a city. The food is shit. There's two places that make good barbecue, and they're not Terry Blacks. It's Franklin and La Barbecue, and it's nine hours line to a blue-haired, tattooed lesbian can give you an attitude when you say, can I add a sandwich to that? People come here to get married like this fool. Because it's cheap And you can get married in some raft You could float down a dirty river And get Down Syndrome drunk And take photos to put on your Facebook 
He did have a beautiful wedding. But the point is this. My point still stands. This is the bachelorette capital of the South. It's drunk pig women <laughs> and men that have an itchy trigger finger just trying to shoot people dancing around 6th Street drunk. These people are out of their fucking minds. It's a fucking rodeo of fat bitches and school shooters. Everybody eating at the trough. It has nothing to do with music. Can we say that now? Can you hear it loud and clear? This town has nothing to do with music. There are heroin addicts that occasionally do melodious things on the street while they're, after they take a shit in the street, they play, I don't know, you are my sunshine or something. You, my, uh, you make me happy when skies are gray. <laughs> it's nothing. It's less than nothing here. There is no seafood. There is no fish. There is one sushi restaurant that Joe Rogan mentioned, and now you can't get in until 2027. Sandra Bullock and Matthew McConaughey, I don't give a fuck. I don't care that a couple of white demon celebrities live here. Shut your white mouth. What's funny about that is that I've been very critical of the critical race theory, and yet I find in times... It is important to have in the pocket. This is what it is. I tried. I played pickleball with a few psychopaths. We met a few tech people. We met a few people who, when you looked in their eyes, you realized that uh, 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 trouble was a brewing. We met some of the masters of the universe, not the bankers, some of the, uh, you know, Silicon Valley cultists who are colonizing the area who are here because of no state income tax and their love of baked beans. Some of the libertarian wing of the tech movement. Some lovely people, maybe not too bad. Don't hate any of them. I like being afraid for my life during the afternoon. I like that. I don't, I don't think facial expressions are necessary. I like people that keep you on your toes. But it's time to go. And I don't want to discourage anyone else from moving here. It may be your destiny to come here. Many of you will be happier floating down a river, which, by the way... I tried to go to the swimming hole. You have to make a reservation for the swimming hole. You can't even jump in the fucking lake without a reservation or the creek or the crick, whatever you call it. I've had about enough. I've had about enough. I can't work on Caitlyn Jenner's campaign long distance. I have to be there. I gave it four months, and I'm not going anywhere immediately. The summer I'm touring, and then in the fall I start to look, and we, who knows where we end up next. Maybe we end up in Dorado, Puerto Rico with the Pauls and Peter Schiff. Here's to hoping. But it's time to go. There was a mass shooting last night. 13 people were injured outside uh, the Vulcan Gas Company. Yeah, the venue of the moment. It's time to go. I love Joe. Joe's been more generous to comics. He's done so much for us. We don't deserve it. He deserves happiness. Go and be happy. And if he opens a club, I will come down here and work it and be thrilled to do so. But right now, it is time to go. This has been a fun experiment. Uh, the quarantine has been very interesting. I've made and lost friends. I've made bad decisions. I've made good decisions. We've all done wild things. Uh, we've put ourselves into situations we never thought we'd be in. And we've taken ourselves out of situations uh, we never thought we would get out of. Our minds melted. We, uh, you know, kind of went through the looking glass. It was an acid trip. 
without having to take the acid. And it was not a good one. It was a bad one. It was good for us. It was good for certain people, you know? But the reality is that is over now. And for some people, it'll never be over. They'll keep the masks on, whatever. Let them, let them do it. Fine. It's fine. But it is now time to leave. And, and you know, it's going to be a little tough for Ben. Ben will fly and do the show every week. And you'll have to really kind of talk to your wife mm -hmm. because it's going to be difficult. But we've suggested gaslighting her into making her believe she made us move here. Mm -hmm. We're, yeah, that's, an F, that's an option. You haven't told her yet. No, I, I, I will before we put this out. You have not told her. I have not told her. Anything. No, not yet. I told you you're renting your house out that you bought, but that's it. Did she ask why? She just, I just said that you were going to make like money on the income from the, the thing and be cash positive. Did she say where would he live? I said he was just thinking about extending his rental here. So you, you lied. Are. Yeah. So you made it, uh, you made something up. So far we're lying. We're in the lying stage. What does she want to do? Go downtown and get a bottle thrown at her head? Is that what she wants to do? Does she want to go play the accordion downtown and get raped with a, a bottle, a glass bottle to her neck? <laughs> We're, it's chaos down there. It's utter hell and it's chaos. Really bad. It's chaos yeah. down there. Okay? It's a horror. Yeah. LA's big enough. Austin's not that big. Mm -hmm. Austin's like seven square blocks, and two of them are hell. Two of them are Fallujah. It's crazy. So what? So to, to do what? So you can eat it. Fucking, you know, Miss Vicky's brisket house. Who gives a fuck? Can we get the fuck out of here, please? <laughs> can we get the fuck? What the fuck were we thinking? Can we get the fuck out of here, please? Do I want pickles and onions with it? No. Give me a ticket. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving. Get the tattoo off your neck, white demon. I've had enough of a white homeless kids. I'm out. We're out of here. Burn it to the ground. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The truth hurts, as Lizzo has said. There's parts of it that are nice. There's parts of it that are beautiful. Not the city. The outskirts. And those will be the parts that get nice. It's a Marin County thing here. They let San Francisco go to shit, and the surrounding area went skyrocketing. That's what's going to happen here. That's what I believe. But I believe comedically, artistically, for me, for you, for this show, for the future of what we have to do, this city has tested me. It really has. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get the charm here. I don't get what everybody else gets. I don't get what's fun about five fat, drunk bitches from Nashville on 6th Street, drunk and falling down. Shoving and then getting in a tub of macaroni and cheese. I don't get it. Look at the band. You want to hear the band? Not good. We've covered it all. We did the tech shit. We had lunch with a few people. We, we did a few shows. They were decent. They were fine. It's time to get out. I don't even want to do Moon Tower, which they didn't ask me to do. I don't want to do any of it. South by, I, I want out of this town for a long time, mm -hmm. for a goddamn long time here. Mm -hmm. I want out of this town. And I, I may rent the house, may just keep it. It's fine. It's a beautiful little thing to have. It's mm -hmm. not that expensive. It's not, I didn't go nuts and buy a crazy thing. So it's all going to work out. But I mean, we do have to tell, we do have to tell your wife and then I'll have to give you guys a bunch of money, which I have no problem doing. But, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. What, what do you feel about this? Be very honest here. Because you got excited to come back to Texas, and it started worrying me because you and your wife started going to see fiddle players, <laughs> and you're like, oh, you should come see the fiddle player with us. And I got very nervous because I said, this is everything you left to not be. Mm -hmm. Somebody, some fucking, some guy sitting in a field listening to a fiddle player. I don't like uh, the golf courses here. I don't like the food. Well, that's nice. Yeah. You don't like the golf here. Not at all. What is the problem with it? I don't like link style courses. Right. I like uh, I like a Nicholas designed course in LA somewhere. Right. Shut like up. A you don't know what cares. But that's <laughs> it's important. It's important that there are things you also don't like. The food's trash. It's not good. It's trash. Yeah. The people. The people. 
It's like if every witch from a Disney movie got fat. It's like what happens to Maleficent if she starts a podcast and eats 14 sandwiches a day and dyes her hair blue. She lives in Austin. Fat people should at least be talented and light on their feet. Jackie Gleason, yours truly. Not these lumbering, soulless fucking vessels. Just barking at people. That's ableist. <sighs> they gotta go. And I wish everyone the best here. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. I wish everyone the best. I cannot stress that enough because as a, somebody who's invested in Austin real estate, it is a great place to live. And that's what people forget is that it is a great city. It's a great American city. And I have a lot of hope for the future of Austin. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it here. And to leave kills me because the food is great, as we've talked about. And the people are great. And I like it. You know what I mean? It's not that bad, yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> so if you're thinking of coming here and renting or buying, it's the place. It's the move. Because what I like about it is you have a good balance of nature mm. and then also a thriving, vibrant metropolis. When you go to Austin, there's always something to do. Get followed by a homeless guy on the way to go get a taco from a, a Dodge Durango that's parked because everybody eats food here out of a truck. You could do that. You could catch a stray bullet on 6th Street while walking back to your Uber that doesn't show up, and if it does, we'll kidnap you. There's a lot of benefits to this city, okay? So I don't want to scare anyone away from it. I have to be, but this is a big announcement. Mm. It's a big announcement. It's a big deal. The fact that we're moving to Dorado with Peter Schiff and the Pauls. Mm. No, we're not. We're not going to Dorado. We're, we're going and we're staying. The next place we go, which is it's got California, we're staying. We're going to Los Angeles. We're staying. Mm. We're going to stick it out. It is what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, we really tried here. I tried. People said it was going to last four months. And it lasted about four months. And, and I'm not leaving immediately. I'm on tour. I'm on the road. And I've got things to do. Okay? IRS! I'm here this year. I'm here this year. But next year, you know, and the fall, you know, it's like it's tough. And I know that you and your wife are happy here because the dogs have a yard. They're going to have a yard in Los Angeles, too. Mm -hmm. The dogs are disgusting. I mean, one of them has three legs yeah. and none of it matters. So it's all good. I I know it's going to be a tough discussion to have. Are you nervous about it? No, no. Katie's uh, ride or die. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. And she was riding Joe. Is there a way? We need to gaslight her into thinking that she made us move here because she has a crush <laughs> on Joe. But we need we need to leave. Mm. There's there's nothing else to be said about it. Mm. Mm -mm. I'm not performing at your bachelorette party. No, I'm not doing that. No, I don't care about your wedding. Ugh, it's a college town, like without that many college kids. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, it, I just I just have to go. Sorry, I apologize. You know, at the end of the day, I wish nothing but the best for the people that live here. I hope that it's only a flesh wound. That's what I'll say. But it's not for me. I must go now. Mm. I must go back to an underprivileged area called Beverly Hills. Where people are real and they struggle. You understand? Where people have real jobs. Like, I'm a sex slave slash assassin slash PA on blackish. Real jobs. Real people. Real America. I'm not excited to go back to California. There's a whole host of issues there, which Caitlyn Jenner will hopefully cure. But it's time to go. It's time to leave Austin, Texas. The faces of the people. The faces of the people, the insects that crawl.
God bless people trying to make this into something. God, I mean, picture. Picture someone you know who's been a disaster their entire life. Drunk, drug addict, in and out of rehab, thief. Just the worst person. Maybe not horrible soul, but just steps on rakes their entire life. Can't seem to get it going. And then imagine the most, the winner, the most productive person you know. The most productive human being you've ever met. Wins every game. Gets the hot check. Gets the money. Is a nice person. Genuinely deserves it. Is generous. That person that you know, the winner, the alpha, the winner, now is bringing the fat drug addict thief out and going, this is the goal. This is the goal. This, and you're going, but that's, they're a fat drug addict thief who I'm pretty sure like looks up things on the dark web and the winner goes, no, 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 no. They're good. They're, it's a much better, they're a much better quality of person. And you go, oh, I don't think so. And the person is screaming as the winner goes, no, 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 this person is good. The person is screaming, no, I'm a fat mess. I like it. I don't like good. I hate good. I never want to be good. Ah! <laughs> Food falls down on the floor, starts pissing themselves. Yeah, heroin. Heroin just... <laughs> shooting heroin with their fat <laughs> arm like ah and then the winner is like that's pretty cool and you go what you go no that's pretty cool that's a pretty cool we wish everyone the best we wish everyone the best here and i'm i'm just hoping that it's been it's been it's made me realize a lot of things living here and uh Culture really matters. The culture of a city matters. Miami's a party. Never turn Miami into anything that's not a party. How dare you? New Orleans is also a fun party. Why ever turn that in? New York is a hectic uh, race to nothing. May leave it be that. Let it be this hectic, frenetic pace to eventual, you know, death. But they like that. It's necessary. It sharpens people. It molds them into something. Ten of them. The rest of them, who cares? But L.A. is a, is a den of sociopaths, narcissists. Mm -hmm. People that it's fake on a level. It's so fake, it's real. You're just talking to human volcanoes as they stuff avocado toast down their genetically engineered throats into their plastic bodies, and then they go vomit it up. It's important, just like New York is important. Just like Miami is important. Just like Austin being the den of failures is important. Being a place for losers. A place for those fat bachelorettes to feel like they're going to the big city. Big mama's in the city <laughs> now. She's got her brisket and she's going to take a shot of SoCo Lime. And then they're going to play her song, which is Up by Cardi B. And she's just going to be like, uh, 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 uh. and her brain, her useless brain is just going to bounce around in her head. And she's going to go, uh, and just this mass of flesh, this total waste of resources, just gyrating like a pig in the middle of the street mm -hmm. while all her friends look at her and go, I can't believe she's getting married. <laughs> This thing is getting mad, and she's going to gyrate in the street because this is her three days to get really fucked up before she has to go back to checking elderly people in for the hysterectomies. And she's just like, it's up, and 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 it's up. And then some mass shooter is going to come out. <laughs> And he's going to see this person going, uh, 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 and the smash shooter's going to look at her and go, you know, the smash shooter's going to say, I'm sorry, Joe Rogan. I'm sorry, comedy. I've got a bit too. And he's going to fire wildly into the crowd. <laughs> like a monster. Like a monster. Not good. Not condoning this. And he's going to hit this fatty, and it will barely stop her. She'll just, she'll feel it, and she'll still 
she'll get a little up and it's up and it's up. And then her friends left to go, you've been shot. And then they put her on the gurney. Uh, uh. And then they bring her to the hospital. And then they extract this piece of metal out of her fucking pulled pork filled flesh. They extract this uh, bullet from her. And she's like, Ugh. and then her fiance calls her and goes, I love you. Are you okay? And she goes, I am okay. I love you. And then she's got a story for the rest of her life. She's got a story for the rest of her life. And then she goes on a little bit of workman's comp, little disability, mm -hmm. can't go back to work. And, and, and then she goes back in a few years to that place in Austin. She goes back there to see where a guy shot her in the leg while she was gyrating to a Cardi B's up, which they won't play anymore. This will be years later. She'll have two fat jalapeno popper sized children and her husband who tries to drink himself into a grave every night and sometimes damn near succeeds. And they'll get out of whatever Uber or which vehicle Austin permits at that time. And they'll get out and she'll go, that's where mommy got shot. And they'll take a photo where she got shot. They'll take a photo where that bullet ripped through her fucking flesh and she'll make it her profile picture and she'll have some quote. She'll have some quote about that how life is about appreciating the little things. And she won't, it won't be a her quote because she's fucking retarded. So she'll take it off some Lifetime movie of the week or some magnet she saw at a friend's home where she was getting juiced before her kids got home from school. And she'll put that quote up and there'll be a photo of where mommy got shot on 6th Street. And that is all this fucking city will ever Burn, burn. <laughs> uh, Barry Weiss, ladies and gentlemen. Oh yeah, Barry. <laughs> Everybody is getting into liquid IVs. It's a fact. First thing in the morning, before workout, when you feel run down, daily hydration, maintenance, hangover cures, etc. What do you love most about it? It's great tasting, functional products. Makes you feel great. I'm telling you, they've donated over 10 million sticks to people around the world. Which hydration flavors or products do you like the most? I personally like the passion fruit. Some people like the guava, the watermelon, apple pie, or strawberry. They also have lemon, lime, acai berry. I'm telling you right now, liquid IV can provide two to three times more hydration than water. It contains five essential vitamins, more vitamin C than an orange and as much potassium as a banana. We just came through a pandemic. You know you got to help your immune system keep everything active, keep everything sharp. Healthier than sugary sports drinks, no artificial flavors or preservatives, less sugar than an apple, made with clean ingredients, non-GMO, vegan, free of gluten, dairy, and soy. What makes Liquid IV so effective? Cellular transport technology. The optimal ratio of glucose, sodium, and potassium delivers water and nutrients into the bloodstream. It's the perfect balance to help you hydrate more quickly and effectively than just water alone. It's great energy. I do this before I get on stage. I have so much energy on stage. People say, how do you do it? Is it cocaine? It isn't. It's liquid IV. One stick of liquid IV in a 16-ounce thing of water can give you as much hydration as two to three bottles of plain water. Liquid IV is on a mission to change the world. They're donating 4 million servings in response to COVID-19. Products are being donated to hospitals, first responders, food banks, veterans, and active military. Liquid IV has donated over 10 million servings globally. So if you love the Tim Dillon Show and you want to support it and you need more energy, you want to feel better healthier, more hydrated. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use promo code TIM at checkout. That's liquidiv.com. Use promo code TIM at checkout. L-I-Q-U-I-D-I-V.com. If you are sitting at home going, am I spending too much on my auto insurance, home insurance, and you want quotes, real-time quotes, comparing the same coverage you have now with other cheaper options, I'm telling you right now, Gabby is the move. Gabby is the way to get better insurance. I know what I've done it. It's the only true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes, not ballpark guesses. Use your current policy to find a better policy, okay? I did this when I bought my car. I went on Gabby. I said, here's the policy that I have. I found a cheaper policy with the same coverage. Average savings are $900 a year, which is crazy, Gabby customers, they'll never sell your info. So no annoying spam or robocalls. 
If you want to start getting your finances in order, you should look at what you are spending on auto insurance. Most people do not even know what they're spending. They don't even look because it's very hard to get accurate comparisons, but Gabby does it. I mean, $961 per year on average, and they'll never, ever be the reason you're getting annoyed during the day. Put your policy to the test like I did. Get a better insurance with Gabby. It's totally free to check, and there's no obligation. Go to Gabby.com slash Tim Dillon. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash T-I-M-D-I-L-L-O-N. Tim Dillon. Gabby.com slash Tim Dillon. See if you can save money on your auto and home insurance right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show exclusive. People were angry with me last week for my one-sided uh, segment on Israel and Palestine with, of course, journalist Abby Martin, uh, who took a decidedly anti-Israel view, as is her right. Um, and so we wanted to find somebody who would come on and present the other side. Um, and we have Barry Weiss, who has, a, uh, has uh, among other things, a very good sense of humor. And uh, she is here with us to present, um, I would imagine, probably quite a different view from what Abby has presented. We're here from the Bitcoin conference in Miami. Barry, by the way, thank you for coming on and having a good sense of humor. We do give you a hard time uh, every now and then, but we do appreciate that you're willing to come on the show. We, 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 we think that's a good thing. Well, the Mossad gave me a special dispensation to be here. They're they're big fans, big big fans. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm I'm sure they are. So my my first question for you would be, what are we what are we getting wrong? Right, like the the narrative that is, um, that that is coming out uh, that most people are seeing is that you have, uh, two groups, um, that are not matched uh, in any real way, not in military uh, might, not in economic power. Um, uh, not in any type of power. You have Israel, which is a, which is a, a strong military, um, and you have uh, Palestine, which is, uh, I believe, two million or so people living in a in a small area that don't really have uh, the military capable of of having what seems to be. It doesn't look like a fair fight, right? It seems like. You have one side. Now, all these words are being thrown out, like apartheid and genocide and things like that. What is mainstream narratives getting wrong? Because it does seem this last conflict, the mainstream narrative seems to have switched a little bit, where people are now seemingly more sympathetic to what's going on in uh, Palestine. And the way I've always looked at it, it seems like a very untenable, unsustainable situation, right? It seems like that. I'm sure that... The pro-Israel people recognize that. People that uh, don't agree with things Israel has done recognize that. Um, but what are people getting wrong about this? When we see, uh, you know, the, the the bombing of Palestine, when we see um, uh, children being harmed, when we uh, see that Palestinians are unable to access medical supplies or clean water or things like that, what about that are, are we not kind of, what are we missing? So I think, two things. One is history, and the second is really the aperture of the lens that you're using to look at the conflict with. So let's start with the second thing, which is if you're looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict like this, you're going to see exactly, to some extent, Tim, what you just described. You're going to see Israel as the Goliath, it has the military power, etc., and you're going to see Palestinians as having the, the less strong hand. But if you widen out and zoom out with your lens, what you were going to see is an entire region filled with something like 22 Arab and Muslim nations and a Jewish state, the only Jewish state in the world that is smaller than, than New Jersey. That state surrounded on all sides, um, the Abraham Accords aside, and we can get into that, by people that don't seek its borders to be shifted, but that fundamentally seek its destruction. I think the thing that people fundamentally get wrong is that they think that this is a conflict fundamentally about borders. It is not a conflict about borders. It is a conflict about whether or not Israel has a right to exist. It is a conflict about Zionism and anti-Zionism. It's a conflict about whether Jews, like every other people, has a right to self-determination, in this case, in their native land, or whether or not they don't. 
That is what the conflict is about, whether or not Jews can have any presence in the region of the Middle East at all. That's right. what this conflict is about. And so to go back kind of to, you know, to to go back, I watched the Abby Martin clip. And of course, I, you know, defend her sacred right to say that 9-11 was an inside job and everything else that she says. But well, there's a lot I'm, about 9-11. We don't know whether it's an inside job or not. I mean, it's not there's a lot we don't know. We covered for Saudi Arabia for years. We re then we said we released a 9-11 commission report. The people on the 9-11 commission report said it was set up to fail. I mean, these are direct quotes. So, I mean, it's not, I understand that no one's saying Jews did 9-11 or whatever. I know some people are. Well, some people are. <laughs> some people are. are you, but there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we weren't dealt with, honestly, about 9-11. We went and attacked Iraq, you know, so. Okay, well, okay. That was a throwaway line. I understand what you mean. That, like, yeah, what I meant to say is that, you know, everyone has the right to their own positions, yes. but I'm not going to sit here and listen while people spew lies. And right. and there's a giant lie that's being told right now about Israel, and it has incredible power right now, especially on the far left. And that lie goes like this. The Jews are white people. They are ethno-colonialist nationalists who dropped into a foreign exotic land with which they have no connection. And since 1948, when they plopped into this land, they have systematically taken that land from the indigenous brown population of Palestinians. And indeed, more than that, they're bloodthirsty, they're warmongers, and they won't stop until they've, you know, immiserated the people around them. And the problem with this is that absolutely none of it is true. It is a fantasy projection created by people with small brains who have an attention span the length of a TikTok video. You know, the Jews aren't, let's start with the Jews aren't white. The Jews are from the Middle East. The right. Jews go back to the Middle East for 3,000 years. That is the reality. The Jewish people precedes the modern conceptions that we have of race and of religion, okay? They were a tribe. They were the Judeans. They were the Judites living in Judea. And the Jewish presence in what we now call the land of Israel or the Palestine, that goes back all the way back to, to, to that period way before Jesus was ever around. The Jews themselves were colonized, speaking of colonization. They were colonized by the Romans. They were colonized by the Byzantines. They were colonized by the Crusaders, by the Ottomans, and finally by the British. And, you know, just to give people a little bit of historical perspective, what is Palestine? What is that name? The Romans renamed the region Syria, Palestina after the Philistines to kind of give a middle finger to the Jews that they had pushed out as a way of punishing the Jews because the Philistines were their mortal enemy. So it's like, you know, when Israel sort of miraculously, and I think this is what makes it such a hard story for people to understand, most indigenous populations are screwed over. They never get a chance to return to their land. But Israel got that chance after the Holocaust in 1948, 1947, 1948. And basically the UN comes to the Jewish people and says, we are, and, and the Arabs living in the region, and says, here is the partition plan. Essentially, the Jews get half, the Muslims get half, and not the Muslims, the Jews get half, the Arabs get half. And the Jews said, great. And their motivation for saying great was they weren't going to get anything else. And in totally realpolitik terms, it makes sense that the Palestinians said no. But then they said no again after every single offer to split the land. And, and I think that that is really what it's about in the end. Do Jews have any right to have any self-determination in any piece of their indigenous land or not? Is, and by the way, it's, yeah. not, it's not to say that you know, given that like little history that I just swept you through, the Crusades and everything else, like, do, is there a longstanding Palestinian connection to the land and Muslim connection to the land? Yes. Of course there is. Right. Is there a longstanding Christian connection? Of course there is. Right. The question is only, do we also acknowledge that the Jews have a connection to that land or not? And that to me is what right. everything is about. Is there room for an argument or a debate where people say we completely understand Israel's right to exist, we support Israel's right to exist, but the expansive nature of a lot of the policies and maybe Netanyahu himself as being somebody who is, uh, you know, has certainly uh, put more of a right-wing face on uh, 
policies and the bulldozing of the settlements and evicting people from their homes. Is there a space for people to argue, like, listen, we think Israel should exist, but, you know, as a, as a, I think because when you say colonial power, I think part of what gives that argument credence in people's minds is that the borders of Israel don't seem to be fixed. They constantly seem to keep expanding and Israel keeps evicting people from their homes and, there, there, there is that. That is what most people regard as a colonial, um, you know, posturing from Israel. It's not like, okay, here are the borders and we're done. And I'm sure it's, you know, there's some complexities there. But that's why, like you said, people are saying, oh, Israel is a colonial state. But it seems like they're that they're not finished. Like the borders aren't, uh, you know, rock solid. That they're expanding and taking more and more territory and some people fear that they're take they're, they want all the territory right so is there a space to criticize bb netanyahu 100 percent. i'll do it right now i did it often in the pages of the new york times is there a place to oppose settlements and settlement expansion in the west bank of course i oppose them i do that all the time what what this is about again is fundamental existence and let, let me just give you an example of that in 2005 israel pulled out every single jew Every single Israeli that lived in the Gaza Strip, every single one, left all of the infrastructure, the hot houses behind, et cetera. What happens then? It's not that there is a flourishing, you know, Singapore uh, on, on in the Gaza Strip. Could have been possible. Tons of money flowed into Gaza. Instead, what there is is a piece of land in proximate, in rocket proximity to the center of Israel, run by a group that says in its charter that their goal is not two states, that their goal is to exterminate every single Jew. This is from their charter. There is no solution to the Palestinian question except through jihad. The day of judgment will not come about until the Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind the rocks and trees and the rocks and trees will cry out, oh Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill them. That's not just in the founding, it's also in these videos that I pulled for you that I don't think many people see. So maybe we want to play the one about with the Hamas senior official talking yes. about. We'll do that now and we'll we'll add that in post. Great. <laughs> تذل دولة الكاد لا تجدن أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشرك لقد أفسد اليهود لقد تغطرس اليهود وآن الآن حسابهم وآن الآن تدميرهم على أيديكم um, Great, and then, yeah. and then there's a second video where the mother of a Palestinian martyr, as, as they would call him, talks about the Jews and says, may their hearts be ripped out, may their eyes be gouged out. لا زال شأن اليهود الذين قتلوا أنبياء الله بيد وحرفوا كتبهم باليد الأخرى قد حان وقت حسابهم لتشل أيديهم وتقطع أفئدتهم وتقلع أعينهم so that is what happened when Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip. Now you have the situation where Israel is occupying the West Bank. And it's a horrible situation. And I right. oppose it. The problem is, is that just from a purely like ex existential perspective, given what happened when Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip, there is an understandable fear. And if you want to understand why so many Israelis feel torn about this, their fear is, okay, what happens if we pull out of the West Bank and there is another Hamas terrorist statelet at our other border and the midpoint of Israel is like a mile wide? That's an existential problem. And right. so you have a tension where obviously continuing to occupy another people that you know, like, I believe in a two-state solution. I believe in the Palestinian right to self-determination, just as I believe in the Jewish one, period. But you have to understand where that fear is coming from and why Israel doesn't just unilaterally pull out of the West Bank as they did in Gaza, you know, 15 years ago. Right. 
Better help, better H-E-L-P. I'll tell you right now, there's no better place to get online counseling. It is fast. Start communicating with a licensed professional in under 48 hours. It's professional counseling done securely online. Broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. Right now, as quarantine's ending, we're all being thrust back into social situations we may be mentally unprepared for. But better help is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need. It's more affordable than traditional online counseling and financial aid is available. Better help, H-E-L-P, wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website. Read any of their testimonials, betterhelp.com slash Tim D. That's better H-E-L-P dot com slash Tim D. Join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. You got to get on the train here, folks. You'll feel much better. You'll be able to communicate more effectively. I'm telling you, it is great. I use it all the time. I call them in the morning. What's going on? Hey, how you been? Better help. Who am I talking to? Is this Ross? Hey, Ross, it's Tim. I feel sad. And then he goes, don't be sad. And I go, that's right. Better help, better HLP.com slash Tim D. Do it and do it now. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Tim Dillon Show listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Tim D. The penis is route. You want them to be hard. You want them to be effective. It's the summer of love. Everybody's happy. Quarantine's over. You're trying to get out there, meet that special person, fuck around, meet a bunch of different people. Blue Chew is a unique online service. It delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, or you can plan ahead and be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll, re you'll receive the prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Blue Chew is great. I love Blue Chew. You don't even have to have sex. Sometimes you just want to take them, wake up, look at it, and go back to bed. It's time to get off the couch and back to work. If your tool needs an upgrade, head to bluechew.com. There's only one thing sexier than confidence, and that's a big cock. Blue Chew can help give you the confidence where it counts. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code TD at checkout. How crazy is that? You just pay $5 shipping. BlueChew.com, promo code TD, first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by another podcast show. I'm not being ambiguous when I say that. That's the name of the podcast I'm recommending, another podcast show. You already know Dylan Wren, Patrick Hickey, and producer of King and the Sting, and this past week at Nick Davis, from when I raved about their hit show, Another Below Deck podcast. Well, they're all back. Imagine that. The unkillable. Uh, the, to ride the coattails of my success for the duration of the final ad read after a Dodgecoin esque investment into the Tim Dillon show in late 2019. They broke it a Ridge Wallet deal, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. This time with a more general show, unconstrained by the shackles of reality TV recaps to cover the trending topics of our time. Like uh, Native American shoe salesmen, Illuminati recruiters living in rural Jamaica, fighting the culinary union and escaping Las Vegas. So if you would like to continue to support fake business, truly... Head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for another podcast show and say that Tim Dillon sent you. Do this, guys. Or leave a YouTube comment on their latest episode saying the same. That's another podcast show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And listen, if they weren't doing this, they'd be doing mass shootings. So let them do this. Comment. Thank you. Why was why was the PLO, like Israel and the PLO had so many issues? It seemed like the PLO was kind of this secular option, right? In terms of, you know, of the different factions of people that Israel could negotiate with. Why were was Israel kind of demonizing the PLO? Is is there a hope again that because when you say the other side is Hamas, I don't know if Hamas represents all Palestinians, right? Oh no no. Let let me be extremely clear. The Palestinians in Gaza are right. living under Hamas occupation. Understood, like, but right, but like, isn't no, that because no, no, meaning, they can't yeah, leave and it's not a functional state? Wait, so there's let nothing, me, yeah. Let me, let me just finish that. I want to be like super clear about in the same way that I would make a distinction between the Chinese Communist Party and the average Chinese person. Right. Of course, I would make a distinction between, you know, 
dictatorial totalitarian leaders who throw gay people off buildings. Right. And like and and actual people who live in miserated lives because of them. And the right. average Palestinian, what do I think they want? I think they want a good life. I think they want the exact same thing that anyone else wants. Of course right. I think. Is but, the, yeah, is my, my my question is like who can Israel negotiate? I mean, now I guess it is Hamas, but how can there be any, like there's a ceasefire now, uh, Netanyahu is out, there's a new government being formed now. Is and there, there's a new quote. Yeah, is there a new what? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's uh, hard to like read you with the glasses. No, I was going to say there's this new coalition government right. with, with an Arab party in the coalition. Like this is a historic thing that's just happened in Israel for the first time ever. This and, Rama party, I think it's called. And do you think is the hope that there will be, uh, you know, something in the in the way of a two state solution being discussed? Because that seems the only possible solution you have. Yes, and I think love Trump or hate, or hate Trump. The reality is. Did anyone 10 years ago ever think that Israel would sign a historic peace offer with countries like Qatar and the UAE and Saudi Arabia, that there would be flights from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi? Like the world is changing. The region is changing. And I think what's happening increasingly, you know, whatever you think of those countries, is that Israel is increasingly being accepted like that it's not going away. And that's right. the key to peace. If the if Palestinian leadership can accept that Israel's just not going to go away, it's not going to erase itself out of existence, that's where peace comes. And I think you see that. And to me, like, that was an enormously huge seismic shift that happened in the Middle East. The fact of this no, new coalition government, the fact that, you know, like 20 percent, and I'm not sure people understand this, 20 percent of Israeli citizens are Israeli Arabs or Palestinians. Like 22% of Israel's MIT, the Technion, is made up of Israeli Arabs. They're in Knesset, they win reality TV shows. Like this is such a, like there is just such a gap between reality and the kind of things that you see from Bella Hadid's Instagram feed about what's actually going on there. And frankly, I would love to take you, maybe maybe Abby Martin would wanna come too, um, to, to give people a sense of what's really happening there. Because like so many things in the legacy press, there's just an enormous gap between reality and this kind of like American parochial fantasy projection. Understood. Yeah. And I'm sure that it is reality shows are being won and it is, it is all love and light. But when you shell, <laughs> when you shell the Associated Press building, bec I mean, that's not a great, thing, right? Can we agree with that? Uh, shelling anything is tragic. Okay. Killing people right. is uh, Yes. What do you Of course. Right. But, but it's it, like, it's it, especially that it's a press building and it seems like you have a but, country but, trying to intimidate the press when Tim, they do that. Tim, Tim, Israel's had to shell hospitals. Israel's had to shell schools. Why? Because Hamas's strategy right. is for innocent people to get killed. I know that it's very hard for like coddled American brains to understand this, but like it is not Hamas's goal to protect its population. Right. It's Hamas's goal to let its people suffer and die. That is why it launches rockets from literally inside hospitals and kindergartens. Right. That's that's the reality. And so like what do you do? Right? If you are and Israel has gone to like insane degrees to try and mitigate against innocent people getting killed, but it's, it's horrible. And there, and it's like, you look at the stories of these children and it's, it's, it's horrible. There's right. like, there's no full stop. That's it. But it's like, we have to look at why they're in that situation. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. I hope that there's some solution to it um, that, you know, upholds the dignity of people. I mean, when you see the way that people are living in Palestine, that's not, I think, a sustainable thing. And most people, I think, looking at this would say it's not sustainable, you know? And I, yeah, I, I, com I completely agree with you. That's right. why I support a two state solution. 
That's why I think that the sooner Palestinian leadership can accept Israel's existence, the closer we'll get to peace. Why don't the Christians go back? I mean, didn't we, I mean, isn't this time to start listening to the Christians, my people? Is it not time to start? you're You're ready for another crusades? I am a little bit. I mean, don't we think it's time now to realize that the other religions have had a time, but the Christians are kind of still the, we're the, we're the ones. You guys are the kings. Well, I, I mean, mean, am I wrong? That seems, well, I mean, we've never well, done it. The Christians, we just behave. We have dinner. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think you need to go back to your crusader history. Here's what I'll say. The, I mean, this is again, like one of those stories that's enormous and that no one has talked about. There has been a systemic purge of Christians from the Middle East over the past several decades. Yes, Coptic Christians in Egypt. Yes, I know that, yeah. There's there's like no Christians left in the Middle East. You know where there's Christians? In Israel. Palestinian Christians. There's no Christians in Gaza. Like, (laughs) Right. Like, so again, like as imperfect as Israel is, like I think people need to have a little perspective when it's clearly a more tolerant society to live in. That's a fact. And where are people who are fleeing, gays fleeing persecution in the West Bank going for refuge? They're going to Tel Aviv. They're going to Israel. Right. So it kind of, it's a little, sorry if I sound impassioned, it boggles my mind a little bit to hear people who identify themselves as progressives and liberals sort of overlooking like the immiseration of Muslim minorities across the, of Muslims across the world. Uyghurs in China, 500,000 Palestinian ref- Palestinians who live in refugee camps in Lebanon and who are not allowed certain jobs. I interviewed a Palestinian guy two days ago, Palestinian, born in Kuwait, built a hummus empire in Minneapolis. Amazing story. Why did he leave Kuwait? Because he was a Palestinian. He told me he's a third class citizen, can't get into university, went to elementary school in the second half of the day because he's Palestinian. It's like somehow only when Israel or the Jews are involved do we care about the lives of Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians. And I think that that is something that deserves a closer look. Well, sure. But I do think that the answer can't be that they've had a tough time everywhere. So, you know, that I, I don't know that that justifies all of like the Netanyahu's actions clearly or, and I'm not you know, saying you're saying it does. But I know that it, it, it's been difficult for them. And yes, they experience, the Arab world is rife with sectarian conflicts where everyone hates each other, right? I mean, that's not, that's not new. I just think that there's got to be some decision about where Israel's borders are. And I think the constant expansive nature of the policy and the settlements in the West Bank and kind of what seems like it's a, a policy that's kind of based on agitation and that to the outside viewer to somebody like me who's again not a big stake in the game here i look at that and i go that when you see people getting evicted from their homes and i know that ben shapiro is saying that it was you know uh, a bill coming due from years and years ago or whatever it's a contract the sheik Jarrah thing i tried to understand i watched him three times it was a contract <laughs> somebody getting evicted. it just doesn't it seems okay you, but, yeah but- but all you need to like just make it super basic. Yeah. The shake the shake Jarrah thing. Yeah. I don't support what Israel was doing, but it was about six homes. Watch those clips from Hamas. What's it about? I like, understand what is that it's really about six about? homes, but I think it's like it, when it's six homes, six families, six groups of people, it just blows up. You think about America and how many movements have been started about you know one interaction with police that's gone wrong. So even though it's six homes, I think that there's like you know, the power of media and the power of everything. It, it, it's, I think it exemplifies the issue to people. I don't think but it's, you have to, yeah. But, but you're saying the power of media. You have to ask yourself, why is there this obsession with this conflict? Why is there an obsession with this conflict to the exclusion of everything else? Well, because it's so long standing. I know, I know that you would say it's because of anti Semitism. No, it's Tibet in China. No, I'm just saying, like, it's not that long standing, actually. It's pretty it's long still- standing, right? It's about, it's about since, I mean, depending on how you count, but you right. could say it's from 48 or 67. In the scope of like ongoing wars in the world, it's not that long. I mean, it's terrible. It's horrible. I think it's the occupation is eating at the soul of Israel's democracy. Like I have no problem saying that, 
But you you have to wonder, like, why is there this absolute and utter fixation with this tiny conflict? Well, America is very supportive of Israel, right? So you have a, any conflict in the Middle East, you have America getting drawn into it on, on, on a, in terms of narrative. Like America has to make a decision. And America has been incredibly supportive of Israel. Um, you know, when Trump moves the embassy to Jerusalem, it just becomes a massive news story because it is America. It's an American president doing it. And yes, there's anti-Semitism out there and people do fixate on things because of anti-Semitism. But this seems to be, it's about the fact that America is so supportive of Israel's actions that I think it makes the story bigger than it might necessarily otherwise be. But it's like, you're constantly hearing about, let's say, American foreign aid. It's like America gives tens of billions of dollars in foreign aid to countries all over Europe, to Egypt, all over the Middle East. And like, there's this obs obsession on Israel. And the, the reason, Tim, that I'm yes. interested in that is like that demonization that is so beyond criticism has actual effects in the lives of Jews in this country. Of course, yeah. Like like when a caravan of people waving Palestinian flags drives through West Hollywood and pulls up to a sushi restaurant and says, who's a Jew? And then beats the shit out of people. Or where a caravan of cars in the uh, a Jewish neighborhood in London drives through and says, fuck the Jews and rape their daughters. Like, yes, and it's horrible. Yeah, no, but, 100%. Yeah, but there's a, there's a, that's, why I'm, that's why I care about this so much. Right. I don't, I care about this. Like Israel's going to do what it's, Israel's its own country. That's a foreign conflict. The reason it matters so much to so many American Jews beyond, you know, the fact that b b for, for many reasons is because the way people talk about Israel has incredible ramifications on Jews all over the world. Should it be and, constitutional, but, though, to boycott Israel if you want to, the BDS movement? Like, it seems to be your free speech person. Is it weird to mandate that American citizens have a responsibility to not boycott the actions of a, a foreign country? Like, with is, those bills, yeah. I think what you're referring to are these bills that, that say, that very well, BDS, states, you know, boycott do, divestment it, and saying, yeah. Yeah. But what the bills say is that Americans, America, uh, that states and governments won't do contracts with businesses that support BDS, just in the way that American, that states have contracts that say we won't do business with companies that support, you know, a white supremacist organization. It's like, what is BDS about? It, does a college student have a right to stand up and say, boycott Israel? hundred percent. Does Abby Martin have a right to go on YouTube and say that? And should her video be not be taken down? A hundred percent. But like, let's be clear about what BDS is. BDS is a movement, not about Palestinian rights, not about creating a Palestinian state, not about opposing the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. It's about the eradication of the state of Israel. And the question is whether or not you think that that policy itself is anti-Semitic in effect, if not in intent. Well, a hundred, a hundred percent is is anti-Semitic if that's what the the policy is. That it is sure, that's but I, no, but should you be allowed? Let's say somebody says, "Hey, I don't believe that Israel or the United States or whatever country has the right to exist because of the way it was founded." Right? Do you stifle that person's right no, to speak, of not. even though it's I think it's a ridiculous thing? Do you stifle that person's right to speak? And I, I my answer would be no. My answer is also no. What right. I think is important to add to it, though, is is what BDS is about. I, I I think people really don't get it. Most people who are supporting BDS, like young people, or you know, that think they're anti-Zionist, think they're just supporting the underdog. No, what BDS is about is the elimination of the largest Jewish community on planet Earth. That's right. it. Miami. And no, that's I'm kidding. The, uh, the, are they trying are to, they're, 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 trying, right now. they're trying to get rid of my Abby wear, I was going to wear like a, uh, like a Boca lady outfit for you, you today. You should have. Well, I listen, Barry, where, where can people support you and find you now? Because I know you left the New York Times. Did you leave or did they get, you, it was a thing, right? You just said it's time for me to go. I, I Jerry Maguire'd myself out of there. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Was it weird it was to work to there where people, people were hostile to you openly at, towards the end? Oh, some people were hostile openly in the beginning, but yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was, uh, it was not the Middle East, but it was a hostile situation. And, you know, like 
you talk about a lot on your show. There's, there's, I think that the most interesting independent voices right now are on the outside and yeah. not the inside of these institutions. And I wanted to leave so that I could be free to tell the truth, which is the reason I became a journalist to begin with. Right. And Where can people support me? Yes. They can support me at, um, on my newsletter. It's barryweiss.substack.com. And I'm going to be launching a podcast in a few days. And I know that you're going to be doing lunch that day or in. No, we just thought you would cancel. That, you just, cause we made a joke about you. So we said, Barry Weiss will definitely cancel a, the podcast, uh, but you, the fact Tim, that you haven't, it's I'm, I'm, we're shocked. You're shocked. I mean, I don't know. I don't hang out with journalists and I don't know these people. Tim, I, I just I'm know that Katie, we make fun of Katie Herzog all the time. And Katie always comes on. We do like yeah. Katie Herzog a lot. Well, Katie Herzog uh, has an amazing series going on right now in my newsletter about um, the spread of the illiberal ideology in the world of medicine. And there's an absolutely yeah. bananas it's piece up there today. It's not, no, good. not good. It's not good. It's not good. People should read it. And uh, no, I'm a huge fan. I mean, as you know, my favorite, even though you go after me and various other people, uh, I freaking loved the segment on the Airbnb lesbians, which I yes. have watched several well, times. They, I'm still banned. And uh, you know, it's uh, you want to talk about Israel, Palestine. This is another longstanding conflict of which there will be no two state solution. And I feel like I'm the, the people that Who are, are getting, you. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like they have, they feel like I have the power and they feel like and they I feel like they have the power. So it, nobody really I just am, I was thrown off Airbnb. I Wait, literally you, can't. you actually are banned from Airbnb. I'm banned. We have to use Ben's account. I stay in hotels most of the time anyway, but like you know, it's it's crazy and it's not even a deep platforming discussion you can enter into because nobody has any sympathy when you're thrown off Airbnb. It's not like you were thrown off Twitter. <laughs> Or anything, people are just like they think you're like unsanitary or something. And and again, it lesbians shouldn't be decorating homes. This is the reality. In the same way that gay men shouldn't be doing certain things, and it's a natural conflict between gays and lesbians. But you know, maybe that will they'll come on and we'll we'll talk it out with them. I don't know if you know them; they're very stylish. I I, I would love to broker that Camp David Accord on this show <laughs> well. as as someone that you know, identifies with parts of who they are, parts of who you are. I feel like right. I can be Switzerland in that situation. Well, so we hope. It. Well, we thank you again, Barry. I know the week was tough. Barryweiss.substack.com. Uh, you can subscribe to Barry's newsletter that's out there and support what she's doing. And we appreciate you for coming on. And now no one can get angry because we've had everybody on uh, except the real winners, the Christians, who should be given the whole area back because we are the people who've never done anything to anyone. That's oh, the sure. truth. Sure. That's the truth. Christians have become the people to really be, to rely on. In my, in my, uh, we have like a nice, we have like a whole, it's too much with the Jews and the Arabs all the time. Bring the Christians in. Let's do the Easter. It's nice for everyone. Barry Weiss, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.